Hi, my name is Florian Stolz and in the next 20 minutes I will talk about our paper Lifeline for FPGA Protection in which we present a flexible IP protection scheme based on obfuscation. And this work was jointly done by the Ruhr University Bochum, the Max Planck Institute for Cybersecurity and Privacy and the UMass Amherst. Now let's first of all talk about the motivation for our paper. And for this we need to look at the current situation. And we see that FPGAs are used in many products, such as industrial automation or machine learning. Of course, when a company creates a new FPGA-based product, they usually do not create the whole design on their own, but they can license pre-made third-party IP cores, which of course reduce the development costs and minimize the time to market. We also observe that various security-relevant domains use FPGAs, for example, aviation, medical appliances or the military. And all of these designs need some kind of protection because you don't want the attacker to manipulate the design or to copy your design without paying for a license. Now some people suggest that ASICs are an easy solution to this problem because they are harder to reverse engineer. But FPGAs are usually preferred because they can be adapted to new requirements on fly because they can be reprogrammed after manufacturing. So now Let's go one step further and look how the FPGA security has been impacted in a negative way in the last few years. So it has been shown various times that the Bitstream encryption engine on FPGAs can be vulnerable, for example via side channels for implementation attacks. Most recently Ender et al. showed it in their paper, the unpatchable silicon. Furthermore, projects such as SymbiFlow and X-Ray aim to reverse engineer the Xilinx Bitstream format which of course opens the door for manipulation and reversing. And lastly, advances in gate level netwist reversing makes it then possible for an attacker who dumped the bitstream to understand the design and see what's going on. Such illegitimate use of course puts the IP vendor and the user at stake because as I just explained, the effort for for example counterfeiting is lowered. Also the attacker might uh, try to manipulate the design uh, and insert faults. This can of course lead to, the, lead to secret keys being leaked and so on and so forth. Now, to understand why state-of-the-art solutions might be not sufficient, we need to look at what a real-world attacker can actually do. So what he can first of all do is perform a static analysis. So he dumps the bitstream and then puts it into some kind of tool and looks at the netlist. But from such a static design, he might not be able to infer all the information he needs. So, in the next step, he can do some dynamic analysis, for example by simulation or by on-chip debugging. In the case of on-chip debugging, he can hook a logic analyzer to certain wires and, and try to understand and see how the modules interact with each other and what values they exchange. Lastly, he can try to perform some kind of design manipulation so, for example, he can cut a wire and he can see how the FPGA, for example, reacts to such a manipulation. So, an ideal solution should provide some protection against all of these techniques which the attacker can perform. To show the ineffectiveness of state-of-the-art solutions, we performed a case study on an industrial solution by a large security vendor. And I will now quickly tell you how this solution works and why it doesn't provide sufficient security under our attacker model. So first of all, here you see our FPGA. And there is an IP core present. And it's connected to an authenticator. The authenticator has some secret values uh, spread around in the netlist and it uses it to calculate a hash. Additionally, we have a separate chip on the PCB which also provides a hash. Both of them are fed into a comparator. And only if they match, the enable line will be pulled high and then the IP core starts working. Now the problem is that both the authenticator and the IP core are already present after the initial configuration. Therefore, by dumping the bitstream, we can analyze and find the connection between the authenticator and the IP core. By setting the appropriate bits in the bitstream, we can cut the wire connection between the authenticator and the IP core. And by doing this, the enable input is always automatically pulled high and the IP core starts working even though the authentication process may fail. Furthermore, the secret values which the authenticator uses to calculate its hash uh, 
I just spread around in a netlist and we can find them using netlist reversing. We can then modify them and take advantage of this uh, to, for example, uh, change the hash. Furthermore, we looked at academic solutions and found that many of them do not suffice under our real-world attacker model. First of all, many use fixed decryption keys and as I have just shown you, we can extract them using static analysis. Other solutions use weak paths as a unique device identifier, however the interaction between the path and the authentication module is not protected. Therefore we can manipulate the wires and perform eavesdropping to find out what values are exchanged and use this to our advantage. Lastly, many use commonly used obfuscation schemes such as finite state machine obfuscation. However, it has been shown that uh, these kind of obfuscation schemes can easily be circumvented. So with these things in mind, let's look what we need to consider when creating an effective IP protection scheme. And first of all, we need to consider several facts. Um, in particular, we cannot rely on the secrecy of the bitstream format because, as I said, there have been several projects which, for example, uh, successfully reverse engineered the Xilinx bitstream format. Secondly, we cannot assume that the bitstream encryption engine is flawless, so we can also not rely on the encryption. So what we essentially need is some kind of trust anchor which reliably tells us if we are running on a licensed FPGA. However, this FPGA might be attacker controlled, so we should defend against several kinds of analysis techniques and we should also uh, defend against design manipulations. And we propose that a sound obfuscation scheme can provide such a primitive. And the idea of our scheme lifeline is that we combine hardware obfuscation with a soft core running obfuscated software. Of course, lifeline should provide uh, protection against our real world attacker model, so we should protect against static analysis, simulation, on-chip debugging and, of course, against design manipulations. And the key idea of our scheme is that we change the static data flow in hardware to a dynamic one, and I will tell you a bit later how we do this, and we change the um, static control flow in software to a dynamic one. And you can look into our paper for more information on that. And what we further do is we bind the hardware to the software, so we make them depend on each other. Hardware cannot function without software, and the software cannot function without hardware. And we show that this provides a real increase in security and protects against a real-world attacker. So now let's talk about the obfuscation primitives that we combine to create Lifeline. And we will start with partial reconfiguration, which has actually already been around for more than a decade. And this feature allows, allows you to uh, configure parts of your FPGA on the fly and the other parts will just continue working uh, without any interruption. For this you just designate an area on your FPGA referred to as a reconfigurable petition and then you generate a bitstream for this petition. Later you can just load this bitstream on the FPGA and it will configure uh, this part of the FPGA on the fly. So, as you might remember, we abused the fact in the industrial uh, solution that the um, IP core and authenticator were already present after the initial configuration and that they were connected to each other. We break up this connection. As you can see in the picture, the IP core and the authenticator are completely separate. Furthermore, we make the IP core a reconfigurable partition and leave it empty after the initial configuration. Therefore, the attacker only gets an incomplete netlist and cannot analyze the IP core. He can only see our authenticator. And we only configure the IP core when we are sure that we are on a licensed FPGA. Therefore, all interactions between the authenticator and the IP core are implicit. Furthermore, we can use this feature to uh, transfer data between registers uh, without actually connecting them with wires. And for more information on that, you can look into our paper. And um, with this primitive, we achieve anti-static analysis as the attacker only gets an incomplete design, as I already said. And in some cases, we also defend against simulation in case the vendor does not provide simulation uh, of partial configuration. For example, Silings does not have the tools for it. Uh, 
but this might vary a bit depending on the uh, vendor. And here you can see again a picture of partial reconfiguration. And as you can see here, we have a reconfigurable partition, which would be our IP core, and we have a partial bitstream which will be provided by our authenticator. And only if all authentication checks pass successfully, we will uh, successfully um, decrypt the partial bitstream, send it to the configuration port, which will then put it into the reconfigurable partition. Now let's talk about our next obfuscation primitive based on crosstalk. Crosstalk describes an analog effect, which can happen when two wires are very close to each other. When this is the case, they can influence each other's channel delay. This will lead to setup time violations and so on and so forth. So typically you don't want this in your design. However, by creating a transmission wire and a receiver wire, we can on purpose induce such delays into the receiver wire and measure them thus creating a covered communication channel. And so we don't need any physical connection between two circuits to transmit data. Now for an attacker this is very difficult to reverse engineer by just looking at the gate level netlist. He also requires some routing information to find out how the wires are actually uh, routed in the FPGA. However, even then he cannot infer what data we are actually transmitting. So this, as I just said, defends against, uh, defends against static analysis but also against simulation, as we cannot simulate such analog effects. And also, uh, we defend against on-chip debugging, as the attacker requires an FPGA from the same family. If he just takes any FPGA and it's not from the same family, and he applies crosstalk to it, he will not get the right results. So here you can see our crosstalk circuit. On the upper side, you can see the input. So we take our input and put it through an encoder and pattern generator. This will transform our data into a serial stream of bits. These bits are then put on the transmitter wire, which you can see there. Then on the lower side, we have the uh, receiver side. And as you can see, right next to the transmitter wire is the receiver wire, which is hooked up to a ring oscillator. And depending on which bit you transmit this ring oscillator, will either be faster or slower. So we hook up this ring oscillator to a binary counter and count the pulses. And if it's faster, we have more pulses, and if it's slower, we have less pulses. So by uh, evaluating the count, we can decide what bit was transmitted. So as you can see here in our experiment, there's a clear difference between a 1 and a 0. In case we transmit a 1, the ring oscillator oscillates faster. And in case we transmit a zero, the ring oscillator is slower. Of course, you can see that there are some outliers here, but by appending a checksum to our transmission, we can correct errors or we can uh, cause a retransmission to uh, get rid of this error. So now let's talk about our last primitive called BIMAT, which stands for Bitstream Manipulation Detection. And with this, we implement self-integrity checks in hardware. And what we basically did is we took a concept from software obfuscation and transferred it to hardware. So if you want to know if your configuration was tampered, you can perform a readback of an FPGA. However, this readback will give you the whole configuration, so it will take time and, of course, it will take space. However, in our case, we are not interested in manipulations outside of our authenticator. For us, the important part of the design is the authenticator. Therefore, we only want to analyze it. And with BIMED, we achieve this. And furthermore, we can spread out these integrity checks temporally. So we don't do it all at once, but we can make it, for example, dependent on the control flow in software. And with this primitive, we defend against on-chip debugging, as we can now detect if the attacker eavesdrops on our connection, and we can of course detect design manipulations. And here you can see an overview of a switch matrix, and as you can see the green wire is the original connection. Now what the attacker could do is in the first case he cuts the green wire and connects it somewhere else. And in the second case he doesn't touch the green wire at all, but he adds another connection um, and with this he can eavesdrop, for example, on the values we transmit. 
As an example, let's say we want to protect the input to the configuration port from eavesdropping and manipulation. For this, we can use Vivado's internal place and route report analysis tool to get a list of inputs which feed into the configuration port and the routing information for this signal. We can then turn this list into frame addresses, word indexes and bit indexes. So on a sidings FPGA, a, the configuration is split into different frames. Each frame consists of 101 words and each word is 32 bits wide. And in a simplified view, each bit represents a connection. So we can specifically check if some bits are set or not, which represent the connections to the configuration port and can influence the control flow of the authenticator based on this information. Now let's finally talk about LiveBind, our flexible IP protection scheme, which uses all of the obfuscation primitives I explained earlier. And now I will give you a quick overview of how it works. So first of all, we have the customer who requests the usage of an IP core and attaches a unique hardware ID to his request. This might be the Xilinx device DNA or the output of a path. Uh, the vendor then generates our authenticator and runs the key generation. The key generation includes the unique hardware ID as well as integrity information uh, of signals inside the authenticator. He then encrypts the IP core with this key and sends back the authenticator and IP core bitstream back to the customer. Here you can see an overview of Lifeline. On the right side you can see the protected IP core, which is left unconfigured after the initial startup. And on the left side you can see the authenticator. The main part is the soft core, in our case a self-written RISC-V core. It's connected to BRAM, which holds the authentication software as well as the encrypted partial bitstream of the IP core. Of course the software is also obfuscated. Now to authenticate the device, the software also runs the key generation and for this it queries different peripherals. First it queries the unique device ID. And the connection between the device ID and the soft core is, con uh, is protected via BIMAT. And uh, furthermore, it's obfuscated using crosstalk. And the soft core is also connected to the reconfiguration controller. And uh, the controller, first of all, provides the data necessary for BIMAT. And of course, it's also responsible for configuring the IP core later. And the connection between the RISC-V core and the reconfiguration controller is also uh, protected via BIMAT. Now, let's look at the security of Lifeline. And first of all, let's look at the hardware side. So, as I said, the IP core is only successfully configured after the authentication. If the attacker performs any design manipulation or eavesdropping, the key generation will fail. It will also fail if the device ID doesn't match. In this case, uh, the decryption is still run, but with a wrong key, which results in a broken IP core. And as I said, eavesdropping can be detected by a BIMAT. Now let's look at the software side, and we use state-of-the-art obfuscation, which can withstand automated tools. We also employ cyclic integrity checking to identify if the attacker wants to manipulate the software. This, uh, this essentially creates a chicken or egg problem for the attacker because the attacker cannot analyze the hardware isolated from the software and he can also not analyze the software without having some kind of simulated hardware because they won't function without each other. Now let's analyze the overhead created by Lifeline and let's start with the hardware. For this we evaluated it on a Xilinx Zing 7000 board and as you can see we didn't use many resources. We only used around 3000 LUTs and 3000 flip-flops and a few BRAM slices. Let's now look at the time overhead created by the key generation if our soft core is running at 100 megahertz. And I want to emphasize that we used a very unoptimized soft core which doesn't have any pipelining. So by using a more efficient core these timings can be minimized. And as you can see after only 560 milliseconds we were able to generate the key which can be used for the decryption of the partial bitstream. After the reconfiguration, our solution does not create any further time overhead as the authenticator deactivates itself and the IP core starts working. So in conclusion, in our paper we first analyzed the state-of-the-art of IP protection schemes and showed several weaknesses.
under a real-world attacker model. We then defined what an efficient IP protection scheme has to defend against. Next, we uh, explained several new obfuscation primitives and then showed how we can combine them to build a flexible and low-cost IP protection scheme. Well, that was all from me. If you have any questions, then feel free to write me an email and thanks for your attention.